Hi, everyone. I hope everyone's having a good night. Hi, hi, hi. Thank you all for joining. Uh, I'm so happy to be here and introduce tonight's event and the New York Peace Institute, which is celebrating its 10th anniversary as an independent organization. I'm really pumped to be here because I've been a fan for and of the New York Peace Institute for a few years now. So I'm equally as much of a fan as hopefully you all are or are learning to be and after tonight will be. So the New York Peace Institute is proud to be the state designated community dispute resolution center for Manhattan and for Brooklyn. New York Peace Institute is also known affectionately as NYPI. It provides conflict resolution services in the form of mediation, conflict coaching, restorative justice processes and skills training to thousands of New Yorkers each and every year. NYPI is also a training institute and a leader in the field of conflict resolution, training thousands of people a year, certifying mediations and mediators throughout the state. We live in a time of great conflict when dialogue and communication is of the utmost importance and New York Peace Institute creates space for effective communication in difficult circumstances. Tonight, Ayana Bahin and Chris Daly will deconstruct a conflict brought vividly to, to life by the fantastic actors, Tim Daly and Sarah Steele, who will also be joining us to discuss their experience acting in the video, which was directed by Annie Kaufman, who is a noted theater director. Ayana Bahin is NYPI's Manager of Training and Business Development, and Chris Daly is the Director of Mediator Training and Quality Assurance, and both are longtime members of the NYPI community. So thank you all again for joining us this evening. I know everybody donated by being a part of this, but if you're watching this later on down the road, because this video will be living for a while after this night is gone, I encourage everyone to either contribute and or spread the word about New York Peace Institute because it is one of the best foundations in New York City. So Chris and Ayana will highlight pivotal moments in the video's conflict and they will point out moments where a mediator's intervention would, be, would have caused greater understanding and perhaps even a potential resolution. Our thanks to Ayana and Chris, our thanks to Sarah, Annie and Tim and their hard work and creativity in creating this unique experience and event for this evening. Now I will turn it over to Ayana and Chris to show us how to be better and more effective communicators. Thank you so much, Margo. That was a wonderful introduction. Um, Chris and I are really excited about uh, tonight, about having this conversation uh, with Tim and Sarah. And so excited that they're able to join us for this conversation as we kind of deconstruct and analyze um, the conflict that they uh, helped to create. Chris? Yeah, thank you, Ayana. Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm so happy that you're all here uh, in real life tonight and also in the future if you're watching this video. Um, we're going to have a fun night. We have such amazing talent in this video. We're so thankful and grateful to Tim Daly and Sarah Steele for their acting job, which we'll get into in a second. There's a lot of energy in what you're about to see. Um, there's going to be a conflict that is uh, fictional, um, but has a lot of elements of real conflict to it. And you will see that it's going to escalate fast, just like real conflicts do. So what Ayana and I will do is we're going to try to get in the middle of the conflict. And luckily, since it was pre-recorded, there'll be some pause breaks. And we'll just give a little bit of like those air bubbles of what we would be thinking about as conflict resolvers if this argument was happening perhaps in front of us or if we were deconstructing it within a mediation. So I hope you can relax and be comfortable and uh, you know be with us in this conflict. Uh, Sarah and Tim, did you want to say anything? Just hi, the New York uh, Peace Institute is an amazing organization that I uh, am ashamed to say I didn't know much about until I got involved with um, abusing Sarah Steele and our little improvisation. <laughs> um, Sarah Steele and I have worked together before and she is the most darling, wonderful, dear hearted person that I could possibly describe. And I just want to pinch her and squeeze her because she's so <laughs> great um and uh, uh and i and you'll see tonight that i'm not um 
acting out on all of my real feelings, I had to put them aside and uh, go for this argument. Thanks, Tim, Sarah. Yeah, I'm I'm so happy to be here. I actually I this is my second event with um, New York Peace Institute, and um, yeah, I just think you guys do incredible work, and I'm excited to get an opportunity to uh, see it a little bit more up close because I, I haven't actually seen you in action doing the mediation. So I'm really excited, and yeah, as an actress, I'm I'm excited to stare at myself. <laughs> so <laughs> looking forward. And also Tim is wonderful and I would never ever in real life throw little pieces of sea glass at him. <laughs> You're giving too much away, but I will say this, that it is, no, I'm just teasing. It is all fiction. It is all fiction, right? Uh, these wonderful actors help to brainstorm and workshop and create these characters. Um, and it feels so real. So thank you so much. Um, and without further ado, uh, let's jump into it. Alex, please play. Yeah, one second. Hello. So we pause pretty early on because from the very beginning, you can see that there's some tension here already between the two of them, right? And you can see that, you know, without getting additional information, um, they're both scared, right? She's scared to take off her mask and he's trying to reassure her that he's vaccinated and that it's safe to unmask and to keep going. Yeah, I'll pipe in here to Ayana. You know, as we're watching this scene and we're trying to figure out, okay, who are these people? What is their relationship? As viewers, we're doing that, but as people within the argument itself, they're doing it too. When people are in relationship to each other, generally relationships are fluid. So there is that first initial moment when you see each other again, like, how are you? Are you good? Are you good? And so for me, when I'm watching this scene, I'm thinking, okay, there's a confession here, right? What's happening is Sarah's saying she's been to a bar and um, perhaps she's been a little reckless and maybe that's anchored in some sort of emotion, like maybe fear or maybe love for her dad. We don't know. So just wanted to point that out about relationships and about who these people are. I got you gluten-free stuff. Um, Muffins. Not gluten-free. Brownies. What? No. Not Donut. Since I was like a teenager, since I was like 17. What? Yes. That was uh, like I did that from like 13 to 17. Well, this is supposed to be really good anyway. Do you want to try? No, uh, I did so much sugar just like fucked my stomach, honestly. Wait, so should, yeah. I'm not like insane about, oh, everything okay? No, yeah, it's fine. It's a work thing. Um, okay. So, oh, this is, this is good. There's nothing in there. What is that? Um, that's. It's a it's a cooler. It's a cooler. Just put it back. Oh my in. god! This is the biggest thing I've ever seen. It's like a bag taking up your whole fridge. I'm going away for the weekend. That you guys is and stuff. Weird, Just Dad. don't give me shit about it. You sure you want to try this? I'm gonna no. Okay, so we have another pause point here. And, you know, here, it's interesting, we're getting to know more about them. It sounds like, you know, there's a little bit of banter about the food. And the thing with food is it is uh, something that brings us together as humans. You know, it's something where we break bread together, we share those relationships together. And the first thing that comes up between these two characters about food is that the dad is out of touch, right? He doesn't know that Sarah 
is not gluten free anymore. So, you know, there's this overture of, hey, I went out and got this offering of food, of breaking bread together, and he's rebuffed. So right off the start, his his overture of trying to bring them close together is, is, is really pushed to the side or seen in a different kind of way. And um, and also, I guess the other thing I'd mention about the fridge is that there's that weird bag there. And Sarah calls it weird, right? She's further sort of like saying, I, I'm different than you, right? I don't know what that bag's doing there. I don't have a bag in my fridge and I'm my own person. And that's kind of weird. That's a judgment. Right. So when we're listening to people and they're communicating to each other, we have to think about why they're saying what they're saying. And a lot of times when we know someone well, things just come out. It's not a thesis. But um, here, since we're uh, in the privileged space of being able to stop a conflict and deconstruct it, I'm making these suggestions to you that these are symbols and things, uh, points of meaning. Uh, they're meaningful for the characters. And while they might not be thinking about it while they're actually speaking to each other, there is a subtext in their conversation where, you know what, they're not necessarily on the same page, even though they're making overtures to be on the same page pitch. And I want to add to that, you know, just in terms of the overtures to be on the same page, she does um, say, you know, pull that bag out and say, this is weird. And, you know, he says, don't give me shit about it. But maybe that's also an attempt for her to try to say, who are you? Tell me a little bit more about you. Tell me a little bit more about what's going on. Um, clumsy, but that's what she might be trying to do. Um, and then he, you know, puts the hand up and says, don't, I don't want to talk about it. It's nothing. Let's move on. So it's interesting because they're both taking steps forward and then taking steps back. And it does give us some clues about the state of their relationship and where they are right now. Oh my God. That's nice water though. Hi. Hi. You know, this you is see. broken. I know, I didn't break it. No, I didn't okay, break it. Did. Um, well, not good. What? For what? I don't know. She had to start working at Amazon again and she hates it and it's an abusive, awful. She's way. She's working. Yeah. At Amazon? Yes. What? Great. Good for her. No, it is not great. It's horrible. It's like completely fucking abusive and such a disgusting company. What? And you should not order Amazon anymore. Seriously. No, seriously. Like, you we're, call mom and ask we're her for a discount. Well, we'll do that. Well, we're why close is to this now, and this is affecting our family now, and we, we, we really are under moral obligation not to order Amazon anymore. It's really fucked up. Well, it's just good that she's working. You know, she hasn't worked in years. Thank God she's working. You know? I mean, yes. I think so. So I, I, I want to know more, right? I want to know more about what's happening here. Like, from his perspective, he's saying, this is great. I'm so glad that your mom has a job and he, she's working. She hasn't worked in years. And, and Sarah's saying, um, you know, she's working at an abusive place. This is really hard for her. This is hard on her. Let's try to support her by not ordering from Amazon, right? I mean, there's so much going on here and they're clearly already just in, in this moment disagreeing and having completely different conversations. Like they're going like this. Yeah, Ayana, I'll come in here too, because again, um, let me go back to the, the start of this scene where we left it off. It's, um, you know, I, I see Tim and the, the great thing about having actors, you know, uh, help us out here is that, you know, there's just so many uh, symbols that are coming across in the relationship with each other, um, both verbally as well as non-verbally. So what does he do at the start? But he goes over and he gives, you know, an embrace 
embrace, like a, a hug uh, to Sarah, you know, and really sort of trying to make that bond with the two of them. And the conversation is tracking so that they are uh, parallel and having the same conversation. But again, to your point, uh, this conversation about the mother comes up and it's really a trigger. It shows that there is a split between the two of them. And um, this one person is creating opposite reactions for both of them. I mean, for the dad, there's some sort of relief, it sounds like. Thank goodness she's working. She hasn't worked in years. And polar opposite for Sarah, where, you know, she's saying this is really terrible. It's actually bad for their mom. And they're on two different tiered levels of listening to each other. So, you know, there's really this big gap in between these two levels of what they're talking about. And they're not exploring the chasm. They might be challenging each other a bit, but they're not really figuring out, okay, how come this is in your opinion so good and this is in your opinion um, so bad. So, um, you know, not necessarily at odds yet, but certainly if you look at the words, not in agreement. So how are you? I haven't seen you since your show. Yeah, um, I'm good. I'm good. I'm really glad it's over. It was mm -hmm. really exhausting. I'm good. I was big. I mean, there are a lot of... Is oh, this... For fuck's sake. Oh, God. Um, oh. That's just this thing. Okay, so right here we have um, the phone and in the form of, uh, and I, I guess some sort of one of those smartwatches, like an iWatch or something like that. And so right when they really start to seem like they're having a real conversation and they're brought together physically with close proximity, you know, what happens? But technology interrupts us. And, uh, you know, the great uniter and that we can all be together tonight from so many different areas all across the state and maybe across the country or even across the world. Um, but right here, this is showing how technology can divide us because that phone goes off. And, um, and it's really more than that. You know, what I think it is when you see something like that is it shows um, importance and the fact that, you um, you know, right now he's being interrupted and perhaps it's his primary life or his, his routine regular life that's interrupting him and maybe she's distracting or even secondary. I noticed also like a shift in the room and a shift in the energy, right? Like you said, you know, it's clear that they haven't talked in a while. They both keep making these overtures, like one step forward, one step back. I want to get to know you. I want to see you. I want to explore this. And then it looks like they're about to get into kind of a real conversation about something that's important to both of them. And then he gets distracted by the watch. Um, as you, if you notice, or if you remember earlier on when he was first bringing her into the house, um, the watch also went off. So it's kind of like, is he really fully present? What's going on for him? Does he need to take a break? Does he need to step away and like deal with whatever's going on? Because his mind is clearly in two different places, which makes it very, very hard to have an important conversation, which looks like they're trying to have. Okay. Um, uh, what were we talking about? Oh, your show. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of stuff there. Yeah. Yeah. It was <laughs> what I worked on all year. Right. So, thing was yeah. Big. Yeah. Was that, um, yeah. Got um, a really central piece in the whole show. So yeah. I, was, I was really happy. And so that's a, that's, well, I mean, how do you, is that a, what is it? A sculpture or? A, um, It's like mixed media. Mixed media? Mm hmm. Like sculpture and painting. Oh, and oh yeah. So and that video. stuff you brought. Uh huh. And, yeah. And like, and, and yeah. jewelry. <laughs> uh, is there jewelry on it? <laughs> yes. For God's sake, you that that charm bracelet I gave you, that Tiffany charm bracelet was what, on that. that from like eighth grade. Well, it's not supposed to stay. That you're supposed to put a new charm on it every year. Well, I mean, oh, I don't know. I thought, I'm sorry if I, 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 
Um, well, I mean, I it was again, I might have liked it worse. in eighth grade, but I don't. It's not something I would. I think it's actually serving its its. So what's that? Did that, what, did that what, uh, what did that mean when it was on? Um, you can. We can. If you no, I have a, you're I, no, it's having a busy day. No, it's just a work. I'm saying you can take it if you want. And no, I can, like, no, 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 sorry. Okay. Um, The phone again. Um, but I feel like we've talked enough about that so that you can see how at this moment, he probably should take a break, right? Because even the tone of voice has changed from that, oh, I'm curious about what's going on with you to crossing arms being like, I'm done. Um, so that's something to notice here. Um, I also wanna point out that the dad tries to find out more information. Like he clearly wants to have a conversation about this art. He clearly wants to talk about the bracelet and what it means and why it was in the art piece. And yet, because he is not neutral, he's it. that bracelet clearly means a lot to him. He's struggling to have the conversation in a way where he's really getting across to the daughter what um, this bracelet means to him. And he's having a hard time really understanding what it means to her and why it's in the art piece because he is, you know, not a neutral. And, and so this is like a really good example of a moment in time when having somebody who's neutral to the situation, who isn't um, taking sides, doesn't have a bias one way or the other, can really help to dig a little deeper and get the important information that they need in order to hear each other and in order to be understood. Yes, I, I agree with that, Ayana. I think the key is uh, the lack of neutrality here. And there are um, some symbols that are coming up and some techniques that we teach mediators. And I want to go to those techniques, but I was wondering, since things are starting to get murky here, I was wondering if this might be a good time to turn to Tim and Sarah and see where their heads were at in this conversation, in their roles. So as these characters, I wonder how the plot was was thickening for you at this point? Yeah, I mean, I guess I'll speak to, I I mean, it's hard because I'm, I find myself wanting to share more about like the backstory that we created for these two characters to justify, quite frankly, how I'm behaving. <laughs> because I think I am being quite mean about the bracelet. Like I, I laugh in his face about it. But I think for me, and I guess I should just say, is it okay if I reveal like some of that? Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. So I, for me, he, he was a pretty absent father. And this bracelet was something that he sent me in the mail when I graduated from eighth grade that like was that was just a very cliche thing to like give give someone like a sort of like I don't know like that that didn't feel like a gift that had any special meaning to me personally because I felt like he, I think I felt like he didn't know me so the fact that he would have a problem with me using it however I wanted I think I'm passive aggressively making that clear like by laughing at him basically like in an in in i like not handling it in the best way that's where i was yes my go, ahead, go ahead tim yes please go ahead tim um well first of all uh it's i i love watching this because i have no memory of any of it it's like watching a tv show like wow what's happening um but I, you know, as I saw that, I agree with Sarah. It's like two people that aren't picking up on each other's sensitivities, you know, because clearly she hurt my feelings by laughing at this gift that I thought was, a, you know, a generous thing to give. Um, and clearly I don't really know her by giving her something that she doesn't really have any use for. Um, and it sort of reminds me not to reveal too much about my life, but uh, when I was early in my marriage, um, my uh, ex-wife now and I were eating a lot of popcorn. We, we had a little baby. We were sitting around watching pop, eating popcorn. And I got her an electric popcorn maker for her birthday. 
And I was like, yes, we eat popcorn. She'll love this. She opened it up. She turned to me and said, what the fuck is this? I was like, what? It's like, you got me an appliance for my birthday? And I was so shocked and, and hurt, but shamed also, because I thought, wow, I, I totally blew this somehow. Um, and I see some of that, you know, that like what, that, that crossing the arms and giving up, like I, I give up. I, you know, I, I thought I was doing something good. And clearly I wasn't, and I, I don't understand what to do. Yeah, we're so lucky to have your insight uh, from both of you and your introspection as characters as to what was going on in your minds here. And how many of us can relate over something where, you know, the gift with the good intentions just bombs or falls flat. Um, symbols, they're complicated. They mean different things at different times for people. And she said, time has progressed here. And it looks like we have people who have journeyed along further in life. And are they closer together or farther apart? So if we have time to go back into it, I think this would be a good time to get back into the video and see what happens to these characters. Uh, so where were we? Oh, so did that, what did that mean? I mean, did that, did that have like symbolism or something? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> what? Did it have symbolism? Well, um, I mean, listen, I don't understand. No, I, I know. You know. Um, uh, yeah, I guess like I I mean, I guess it's what? I don't know. It was a way it's a way I mean, it's of taking of... these these sort of nineties um images that we're all really familiar with and you know, putting them together and kind of Because I mean them. what I don't understand is why you had to use I mean that was an expensive bracelet. You couldn't have used okay. something that represented that <laughs> Um, I guess what I should be clear about is that I would never wear that bracelet. I so well, that's this was okay. a good way for sense. me to use it, yeah. but um, I can't believe we're still talking about it. And so they're both coming from their hurt places, right? They're both talking from the hurt feelings, and so they're continuing to kind of hurt each other in an attempt to be understood and be seen. Um, and I think, you know, I really appreciate Sarah kind of sharing more about the backstory of her character because you're like, wh why doesn't she see what he's trying to say? And also for Tim to do the same, why doesn't he hear what she's saying? Know me, you don't know me. And I think that divide and that misunderstanding, you know, from the very moment that they first walked into the apartment together and and started talking, it just continuing to compound um, from each, you know, interaction, like they're, instead of moving forward and, and deepening their understanding of each other, um, the divide is growing. And again, you know, as a mediator, you know, there's all these clear signs, there's all these uh, symbols to pick up and ask about, you know, I see that they're trying to do it, but because they're so invested in the answers, they can't quite hear each other and a mediator would be really helpful here. Yes, agree, Ayana. A mediator here would do something that we call the two-step at New York Peace Institute, which is when there is a symbol or a phrase or a conclusion or some sort of term that um, seems vivid, we would, uh, as a mediator, pick up that term and say, I heard you say this, what does that mean to you? So we would actually just pause for a second and say, you're both talking about this bracelet. Can you take a, a moment and just tell us what that means to you? Um, because oftentimes we assume that our thoughts and our meanings about something are ascribed to by the other person. And almost always they're not, they're different um, to degree or even to a, a radical point. So, um, I'll just finish my remarks here by saying, Sarah in character right here tries to explain that to Tim. She says, dad, what, what you don't understand is I would never wear that, that's not me. I mean, she's overtly saying that and he's still not hearing it because he sees his daughter perhaps one way and that's a hard mold to break. Okay. Um well, let's, but but so the, so the show like what's the what was the point of that show like you 
about to um, sell the, that thing? Uh, that that show, no. Like, that show is just that yeah. show is just like a uh, that was just like a thing for school, like a, a way for all of us to show what we've been working, and then we get. So when do you start on. to sell sell stuff? That's what I mean. Um, yeah, or, like can like is it? I mean, possible? yeah, you can try to sell the stuff that was going on at that show. I don't. I'll have to. I would have to look. I'm. It's not really on my mind at the moment. I'm just really trying to like focus on school and focus on improving my work and and uh, you know focus on the relationships I'm building with mentors. Right. So that's like schmoozing. You know? Um. I mean, well, I mean, I'm learning a lot from them too. It's not just schmoozing. It's like learning how to. Yeah, because I. Gosh, so I, popular. I, no, it's not. Believe me, it's not popular. It's just some shit going on. Um, it's fucking COVID. So I want to pick up a couple of things that happened here. And one is the word schmoozing, right? Um, Tim says, so you're just schmoozing. That's all you're doing, you know, which kind of seems like, you know, a waste of time and sort of material, you know, just about the money. Like you're just, there's no there there. Um, and Sarah's talking about how she's trying to build relationships and create mentors so that from this show, something else will come. Like this is how, from her perspective, you build a career, right? You have a show, you talk to different artists, you get mentors, then they mentor you and bring you in and, and, and expose you to other things and provide opportunities. And so to her, you know, even using the word schmoozing seems to denigrate what she's trying to do, right? Um, and for Tim, he really wants to get into a conversation about money. And so, you know, it start. he's using this word schmoozing because that's poten potentially what's on his mind, right? Um, and he's still probably a little upset about the bracelet, um, even though we've moved on from that conversation, it's still very present for him and for her. Um, the other thing I noticed was, you know, after he got that call and he says, fucking COVID, like that's a moment where, you know, he's kind of like stripped down to kind of just the essential humanness of dealing with this moment in time um, and this crisis. And it seems like Sarah, you know, could relate, right? Because she too is struggling through COVID in whatever way that she is. And it feels like an opportunity for them to connect again as humans on a human level, as people dealing with this uh, crisis. Yeah, I'll just mention uh, two quick things here, Ayana. I think that universality of experience and, uh, is an opportunity, but unfortunately, when you're caught in something that's brewing, sometimes you don't seize upon those opportunities. And what happened here might sound mundane to us, you know, to us watching this, but what really happened is Tim sort of questions the entire purpose of Sarah's drive at this point. And he turned to her and he said, what's the point? of the show um, and and when she has to justify what she's doing. And I think she said that was, you know, I had the main um, art piece, right? Apparently her work was the focus of the show. Instead of the conversation going to that, there's a pivot to money. Is the goal, is the objective to sell? And um, there's a nonverbal that Sarah gives like a humph where it's just, you know, no, they're, they're in different value zones. And um, this is uh, something that's very frequent in conflict where you have people coming from similar families, the same family, similar groups. They might assume that their value structure is the same. And when values are ordered in a different way for individuals within the group, it creates tension and friction and conflict. Um, at this point, I don't know, uh, Tim and Sarah, if you want to say, uh, you know, give us a little uh, insight into your headspace uh, before the storm really brews. Hmm. Tim? Well, um, it's funny. I, did, I didn't, again, I, I really don't remember <laughs> doing this uh i mean i remember in general but some of the specific stuff and i remember um when i was in college uh i, I did a play my dad was an actor i come from a family of artists and my dad came and saw me in this play 
And I went and had breakfast with him the next morning. He had a legal pad with about 20 pages of notes. He hated me. He hated the play. He hated everything so much. He said, I am no longer going to pay for your college education. You're a dilettante. You're out. And I, I was just so shocked by that. Um, and uh, the story of how I got him to um, help me pay for college after that is very funny. Uh, but uh, he did. And then he came and saw me in another play. And he thought I was great. and He loved it. So he said, okay, it's fine. But um, it's, you know, I think that it's, I, I think that it's born in a weird way out of love and fear that your offspring is not going to be able to make it on their own in the world. You want them to be able to go off on their own and make enough money to live. And if they're wasting time, you think, oh my God, are they just gonna, you know, starve out there or be or be latched on to me? And will I not have done my job as a parent to um, help uh, uh, someone be able to exist on their own? Yeah. Yeah, and I think I think for Sarah. I think she feels, I think I think actually what's going on with her in this moment is that she doesn't know where this is heading. She, do, she, doesn't, she doesn't understand why he's talking about selling it. So she's just being really honest that like, no, that's actually not where my head's at right now. Like, like because she, she I think feels, and I'm not entitled in a bad way. I don't use this word in a bad way, but entitled to time to figure out who she is as an artist. And I think she's not, she doesn't really, she's, she's not really sure why he's asking about that. Maybe she just kind of thinks he's, doesn't know how else to talk about art. Yeah, great insights from both of you. And both of you focused on needs. We're getting to the heart of uh, the argument here. And if you think about needs, let's go back into this scene. Uh, so this is what I don't understand. I don't, I don't understand like what the, what the end game is here. What the end game is for what? For graduate school. I mean, um, I mean, I, just, I'm going to be, listen, listen, I'm going to be, I'm going to be really honest. It is okay. so fucking expensive. It's mind blowing how much money I have to make. Okay. To pay for grad school. So sorry, are you and saying that you're not going to pay? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying I need to understand why. What? Okay. I need to understand why I'm paying. You need to under well, because you're my father and I've no, no, never that, asked anything uh, fucking from you before, like until now. Well, Are you serious? No, listen, I know I'm your father and I know that I've always supported you. What? This is the first time that I've ever asked you for anything. This is the first time I've asked you for anything. You, you, listen, and you've, now never you're had like, you. what? you've never had to ask me for anything. You've never had to ask me for anything because I always provided. Are you? Well, I feel like I'm in the fucking twilight zone. What are you talking about? I'm talking about I that I supported you your whole life. I put you through four years of college what? and your sister. You never, I pay. I pay. I pay your mother alimony that I have oh to pay for the God. rest of my yeah, fucking life. Yeah, because you're fucking required to. I don't. We're using that money so yeah, that she can fucking to, survive. Because I got fucked up the ass by a fucking oh lawyer. Oh my God. This is un okay. Listen, I don't know. You're clearly having some fucking crazy psycho white male rage moment right now. I really don't feel safe. I really okay. I don't feel. Oh, you don't feel nervous. safe. You don't feel safe. No, I like, don't are you feel triggered? safe. Is that is that how? It's First of all, I are don't. I feel like entitled? I don't fucking know you. And now you're screaming at me. I'm not screaming about, at you. Well, I'm trying the to have one time that I've listen. asked you to provide for me. I'm not. The one time you have not given. You have not given me jack shit. You've never that supported me financially. Is, you were never there for me. That is not I don't true. fucking not, know stop you. Stop it. Stop it. It's not true. I paid for your entire life. I paid for your mother's what life. Happened? I paid for what your sister's you life. For I paid for college. Life. I did. How, how can you say that? How did you do that? That, that, that trip I was supposed to go on with my friends that I asked you for money for, you didn't fucking pay for that. You never paid for a jack shit. I you paid. just paid for this fucking apartment and your fucking girlfriends. This is such a joke, oh my okay, God. Here we go. So this what? is such a joke. Ooh, that got hot so fast, didn't it?
Partly because, you know, like Sarah keeps saying, you don't know me. They don't know each other and they are missing each other. They are completely misunderstanding each other. Um, this is a moment when it's clear that they both have very different sets of facts that they're working with and different information and how that has kind of influenced their view of the situation. Um, for Sarah, you know, she's saying that her dad has never really given her any money or helped to provide for her. She said from the very beginning that her mom is struggling financially, um, that she's working really hard at Amazon. And so she's been having to work hard because she feels like, you know, she's not being supported by the dad financially. This is the first time for her that she's coming to him, asking him for money. He just came to see her show. And instead of talking about the show and like, you know, noticing that she kind of was the key of the exhibit. She, instead, he wants to talk about, you know, are you gonna, how are you gonna make a career out of this? And how are you gonna pay for your life because it's too expensive for me? Um, from his perspective, he is saying like, he gave more money than he had um, to support the mom and to support them and he's, always been supporting them and can't believe that she doesn't know that and doesn't value that like he sees himself as a provider and doesn't understand why she doesn't see that so they're clearly you know not seeing each other for how they want to be seen and um really it went from zero to 60 in a minute chris yeah, zero to 60 in a minute for sure. But isn't this what happens? All of a sudden you realize, oh my gosh, we're in it. It's happening. We're on, right? And to Ayana's point, what's happening here is really clear to us as conflict resolvers that there are two different narratives of who these people are and how they see each other and how they're vibing off each other. At the end, when we just paused here, Sarah said several times, this is a joke, right? It's a joke. And she's saying it's a joke, I submit to you, because it's not rational to her. She can't think of how those puzzle pieces fit what her dad is saying. She's not seeing him as the provider. She feels very misunderstood. She even said, I think, I feel like I'm in a twilight zone, right? She's feeling like she's not being seen or heard. And Tim, same exact way. He starts off that conversation really saying, I don't understand the end game, but then he uses a verbal crutch that a lot of us use in conflict. He says, I'm going to be honest, right? I'm going to be honest. It's so fucking expensive. And that crutch can be used in a lot of different ways. And we talk about that sometimes when we're, um, you know, a neutral party in, uh, in a conflict. But here, he's really trying to bring her in and to say, you know what? This is the heart of it. This is the interest that I have in this conversation, this is the stake. Um, if we have mediators on this uh, you know, seminar right now, you'll know what I'm talking about with interests and the positions. Um, and what we have right here is we have people spiraling from their positional arguments, getting down to the latent interests here, what's really fueling them. And the fact is they're not seeing and hear each other for what they really are. Um, I think we should go back in and see what happens. My girlfriend? Yes, your girlfriend. Do you think I don't like know about the 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 you fucking brought her to my show? How old is she, by the way? 27? Like it's disgusting. Look, that and you know, that is the last fucking, you know. Uh, <laughs> oh, wow, you're uh, really listen, struggling over listen, your words, my friend. No, no, I'm not. Because you have I'm no not. idea what to say. Look, look, we you know, we Th there's taboos about everything, right? Oh we, we do label all this stuff. And the last one left is, is like when you fall in love with someone who's younger than you, right? Oh you, so you God. can't do that. I'm sorry if I'm a fucking cliche, but I, you, your heart doesn't. You're definitely a cliche. Wow. All right. You're fucking cliche. And what is a cliche? Oh, no. It's an overused story right? Or stereotype. So not only is she not seeing his story or hearing his story, but she's telling him, nah, your story's trite, right? Like, I don't buy your story. I, I, I'm, I'm not validating you. I'm not validating your story. You're a cliche. Cut, cut, cut. Right to the heart. Oof. Ayana. That is tough. That is a really tough one. Um, I wanted to uh, 
check in with Sarah and, and Tim to see if you want to provide any insights about what was going on for you in this moment. Oh, God. Um, I guess, like, it is a cliche. I don't know. Like, I don't know. I don't, I, it's like, I'm just, I'm just stating the, I'm just, I, I'm heated and that's my opinion. It is a cliche and it's hurtful. It's hurtful. The thought of a father dating someone barely older than you, like, it's just like, it's the oldest kind of bullshit. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's okay. We're cursing here. Okay. <laughs> Um, that 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 you deal with with men and a, a man that wasn't there for me and then is dating someone my, my age yeah that's lame I think that's what I was thinking you know I, th I think that what I take from this is that uh, these people actually really love each other mm -hmm. I mean maybe that's why it gets so hot but yeah. but it's 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 almost like he really wants to be sort of accepted by her. They both want to be accepted by each other, yes. but it just all goes wrong. And she stabs him. She knows his soft underbelly and just boom, gets right at it, which, you know, triggers him. I mean, it's just like, to me, in some ways, this whole argument is cliche. You know, it's it's uh, something I think that, that plays out with, with children, adult children, especially, and parents. Um, when the, the adult children or the parents are trying to transition the adult children into people that can be self-supportive. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, uh, you know, at this point, they're just not listening to each other. They're just, right. they're, they're almost in attack mode, it feels like. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. They are. They're, they are not listening to each other. They are trying to hurt each other. They are, you know, and they are just coming just straight from their emotions. And I love that you say this is, you know, these are stories that we've all seen, maybe been a little bit of a part of ourselves in our own lives, right? Because, and they're cliches for a reason, right? Because they are, you know, kind of part of the fabric of um, the relationships that people have with each other, parent, child, girlfriend, you know, et cetera. Um, so really, really fascinating. Thank you both uh, for that insight. And um, let's get back to it. You're okay. definitely a cliche, okay. but that's not the point. The point is, I don't give a fuck if you're a cliche. I don't actually give a fuck about your life. I... All right, well, listen, if, if, if you don't give a fuck about my life, then I think we should... Um, all right, so cut me off, so cut me off, so cut me off, and then I won't have to talk to you. I don't want to cut you off. Listen to me. I love you. I want you to succeed. I want you to be able to go into the world and support yourself, and you have no ability to do that. Oh None. My God. None. What? When have you ever had a fucking job? Never is the answer. Never. Actually, the, the answer is you don't fucking know because you don't know my life. I waitressed for two years in high school. Did you know that? No. You want to know why? Because you didn't fucking for know me for, then. For what? A, a, a month during the summer? That's bullshit. All summer. You I should have a job right now. You should have a job right now. Listen. God. Listen. I had a job. I, every, have a I had job. a job all through college. I had a job, of, you know, I worked as much as I can, could all through college because I had to be on a scholarship. I didn't have money to pay okay, for college. Okay, fine. I, and I I'm not care. saying, I'm not I comparing. I am glad to pay for your education if it's leading it to something. But like if you're that. just going to fucking throw your life away on that stupid sculpture, that whatever oh that fucking God. huge this is so piece of shit with an $8,000 this is an abusive glued this, onto is, it. this is an abusive it's not abusive. who's not, being abused actually, it cost me two hundred thousand dollars a year to pay for your fucking grad school your you're my father answer the fucking phone god damn it you suck hey 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 oh are you fucking kidding me you suck i'm serious I this suck. is crazy this is crazy this is an abusive conversation and i'm not gonna have it anymore and you know what you don't even fucking know me you don't know me you don't know anything about my life you have no idea what art does for me i would be fucking dead What's without art it you? i would What's be dead you? without it i tried to kill oh, myself art. when i was 17 did you know that what? no because what? you don't what fucking do you mean? know what do you mean me you tried to kill yourself yeah yes wait, wait. get hmm. off me
Wow. Okay. So, you know, it takes a turn here. Um, and it gets really intense. Um, it, it turns into a bigger scope than just um, an art piece or a bracelet or um, a casual conversation. What's really underlying this conversation is fear. It's, there's, there's scary things going on here. Um, and, and a lot of them. Um, I mean, there's the fear that it seems that Tim is having about, um, you know, his daughter not being able to make it perhaps um, without his help in the future. Um, there's fear that Sarah seems to be uh, mentioning about her identity not being validated and not being seen and how important and central her art is to who she is and how she survives. Um, I mean, it can feel abusive when someone doesn't see you for who you really are. Um, that can cause real harm. And then I don't know if there's an outcry here or some past trauma, but, you know, you know, unfortunately, in conflict, sometimes when the conversation goes deep, it can bring up all past sorts of things that haven't been hashed out. Because a lot of us have been socialized to not really deal with conflict, but to suppress it and to hold it down. So I'm not pretending that, you know, I know what's going on here, but just putting forth as a conflict resolver that um, sometimes when it gets stirred up, things that haven't gotten attention get stirred up too. And they're heavy. They involve agency and power and freedom and ability to be who you are. And that can be at the heart of what seems like the simplest of conversations. I think we should play the rest of the video. All right, Sarah, mom, for me. Oh, really? Wow. Seriously, Sarah and Tim, wow. That was intense. Thank you so much for like really going there, like going so deep, being so raw, so emotional for us because that happens in conflict. And it's so important for people to be able to see that happen. It goes, conflict moves so quickly. You know, you think you're having one conversation, then you're having another and then another. And um, it's truly um, really special that you were able to, you know, go there and create these characters and really show us um, some vulnerability and some depth and heart. So thank you. I'm echoing the gratitude for having such great actors here. And um, my understanding is I think we have a question um, that's been submitted. So I, I don't have the ability to read that, but um, Rachel, if you could read that, or if someone could read that question for Sarah and Tim. Um, yeah, so um, we have a question for Sarah and Tim. Uh, did acting out this conflict feel different than acting out a scripted conflict? Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, it really did because, uh, you know, we had, we, we were just making it up and trying to respond to each other. And one of the things that I, I know, one of the things that drives me crazy about scripted um, movies and television is that everything, arguments become very clean. Yeah. People get very worried that you have to, this person has to go, then this person has to go, and they very seldom overlap. And what I noticed in this is that we were all over each other and you can hear both things at the same time. Your brain can absorb both of them. And I wish that more uh, television and movies, you know, filmed entertainment could realize that human beings can hear those two things at once um, without everything having to be pristine. Yeah, and I think often when an argument is written, it's written by one writer who's like working out two sides of something in their own mind. 
And it's so interesting. I feel like I've just learned from this event, like, I feel like typically when you're doing an argument that's scripted, it makes more sense strangely than this one does. And maybe maybe this one is more real and more typical of, of actual arguments because they're not operating with the same facts. They're, you know, they're not hearing each other. They're not, it's not, a, it's not, they don't come to any conclusion. And, um, and yeah, so that's so that's that's really different. So I do agree with you, Tim, that it's that it's it 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 feels like people when arguments are scripted, they're they're much more like thought out, and they make and, more. And sense. often I think that um, you know the, the you know that the writer has a point of view, like this person exactly is exactly, person. and totally. this is like way more complicated because. Totally you know, both people are sort of right. Both people are sort of wrong. They're just, you know, it's just a mess. Yeah, a mess, yeah. Thank you for that perspective. Yeah, you know, it's interesting how when we're in the argument, we feel like we have the right point of view oftentimes. And whoever the writer was perhaps might've had the right point of view. But I love these words that it's, it's neatly taken care of when it's scripted and it's tied up in a bow. And that's one thing that mediators do is because oftentimes what happens, we don't tie it up in a bow, but what happens is people are having real conversations that are sloppy and left unresolved. And there's that bad feeling that you have at the end of a misunderstanding. You're like, I just don't like that person. I don't know what happened with that relationship. What we'll do at New York Peace Institute is we'll provide a space so that we can say, okay, what happened? And then what's the path forward, right? What's the plan? And the plan is self-determined by the parties. So there's real power in what we do at New York Peace with that bad feeling that the writers want to tie up in a bow in shows or movies or stories that we tell people. There might not always be an apparent moral. I don't know if we have another question. Uh, I think we probably have time for one more. Yeah, um, so one question is, how does this compare to an actual mediation? Oh, that's, that's tough. I mean, the fact that the parties, the, the, the participants, like the father and daughter, couldn't understand each other, that the conversation went all over the place, that happens in mediation a lot. And um, it's kind of our job as the mediators to help slow things down a little bit so that we can unpack it and help them to understand it, understand their own position, understand the other person um, a little bit better. Um, so, you know, it's similar in that way. Um, it's tough to watch because there were so many times when like as a mediator, you want to get in there and help them have the conversation. And so, yeah, Chris. Yeah, I just echo what you would say, what you just said, Ayana. It's that there is a real um, strength in not having a stake in the race, right? So you can be objective as a mediator for a lot of an argument. Of course, our biases are going to come in and we're going to align with parties at different points and we're going to agree with certain decisions or have an idea as to what should happen. But we go through a lot of training where we identify those and we try to put them to the side to really have humility and have the parties amplify what they need to say. And then we can help them sort of categorize that, headline it, say it in a neutral voice to each other with reflection and help a negotiation if it could happen so that there could be some sort of forward movement, even if the movement is far away. You know, a lot of times we always think, oh, mediation, there could be reconciliation and agreement. Sure, that would be wonderful. Um, and in a lot of cases that does happen and it's more durable than if someone tells you what to do, but sometimes people just need to walk away. And then at least maybe there's a little bit of resolve and a better understanding as to why they're choosing to walk away. So I wanna be mindful of time. It's eight o'clock, um, time flies, right? <laughs> when you're having these kind of conversations. So um, Sarah and Tim, you know, thank you again. I wanted to give you an opportunity if you wanted to say any last like something um, before um, we invite Margo back and, uh, and say good night. No, just thank you. It was so fascinating to hear you guys speak about all this. It's really, 
it's really helpful. Yeah, so thank you. Yeah, I mean, I just wanna say thank you to um, the Peace Institute uh, for the work that you do. And, and um, I, I, I wish that you could reach a lot more people than you do, even though I know you do reach a lot because um, so often uh, conflicts happen for the wrong reasons and people you know, aren't able to hear each other. And if they do, uh, there's a chance for progress, you know, and, and, and I mean, at the best, you know, reconciliation and real growth. So um, uh, thank you for all your work. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you both. Unbelievable scene. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> Amazing. Um, Sarah and Tim, that made me squeamish <laughs> at best. Um, really, really hard to watch that. Uh, I, I, I just have to, I mean, Chris, Ayana, you ladies are so powerful. Just, it, it was so interesting to get to watch a conflict in real time almost, and then see you guys break it down moment to moment. You really get to see how it starts to, how people start to evoke each other and then it can transform into something so much bigger. You can really press the brakes and pause it in its time. And I know we, we all have family things. Um, I know I have my own personal family things, uh, but it was interesting to see it in, in a scene like that that was so intimate and so honest. And I agree with you guys, Sarah and Tim, that sometimes in writing for, for movies and for TV and for theater, it's so catered to each other, just allowing each other the space <laughs> to kind of get your point across when in arguments, we never allow each other the space. Um, and the importance of New York Peace Institute and how you, you ladies and the whole program can really uh, help people learn a little bit more. I just learned so much tonight. And to Tim's point, these people really do love each other. I thought that that was so well said. It's so honest, you know, mostly in relationships, we really do love each other at the root of it. I know as a fellow actress, I, I always do everything with love. If it's an evil role, if it's a vindictive role, you do every single thing with love because that's honestly what people's minds think that they're doing. Whether it comes out like that or it doesn't, you do things with love. So New York Peace Institute, thank you for allowing us to do this with love tonight. Thank you for giving us this space to learn tonight. This was so amazing. As a reminder, thank you guys, everybody for watching. And I know everyone donated tonight, but I really, really, really do encourage everyone to get the word out for New York Peace Institute and continue to donate to this amazing foundation that really helps us to bridge that gap and divide. So thank you guys so much for allowing me to start and kick this night out and, and end it. It was really um, a lot of fun and uh, cringeworthy and really, uh, really informative. So thank you all so much. Have a great night, everyone. Be safe. <laughs>